Hello, and welcome to another day of Living with Spina Bifida. I've been having some brain pain today in, in the shunt area, so I thought today would be a good day to talk about the shunt and hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus is very common in people with spina bifida. It doesn't always happen, but it does quite often. It also happens in other birth defects, and it could also happen if you have a brain injury. So, what is hydrocephalus? It's derived from the two words hydro and cephalus, meaning head. So, water, head. You have water in your head, in your brain. It's also known as water on the brain. And that water is actually cerebrospinal fluid. It's a clear fluid that surrounds the brain and the spinal cord. And some people, the people with hydrocephalus, they get too much of that fluid floating around in their brain. They need a shunt. It's a little tube that they put in one part, goes in your head, and then it goes down, 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 down. And depending on the kind of shunt that you have, it drains from different, into different organs of your body. Mine goes into my bladder. So, as I have said before, I pee a lot, and that doesn't help. Because I'm getting more fluid than I take in. Getting put down into my bladder. So, there are different types of hydrocephalus. And one may be congenital or acquired. Which is present at birth. Meaning that's what happened with me. I was born with it. I had a shunt put into my head very quickly after I was born. Hydrocephalus may also be communicating or non-communicating. Communicating hydrocephalus occurs when the flow of CSF, cerebral spinal fluid, is blocked after it exists in the ventricles. This form is called communicating because the cerebral spinal fluid can still flow between the ventricles, which remain open. Non-communicating hydrocephalus, also called obstructive hydrocephalus, occurs when the flow of cerebral spinal fluid is blocked along one of one or more of the narrow passages connecting the ventricles. One of the most common causes of hydrocephalus is aqueductal stenosis. In this case, hydrocephalus results from a narrowing of the aqueduct of sylvius, a small passage between the third and fourth ventricles in the middle of the brain. There are two other forms of hydrocephalus which do not fit exactly into the categories mentioned above and primarily affect adults. Hydrocephalus ex vacu and normal pressure hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus ex vacu occurs when stroke or traumatic injury cause damage to the brain. In these cases, brain tissue may actually shrink. NPH is an abnormal increase of cerebral spinal fluid in the brain's ventricles that may result from a sub subarachnoid hemorrhage hemorrhage head trauma infection tumor or complications of surgery however many people develop NPH when none of these factors are present an estimated 375,000 older Americans have NPH. Who can get this disorder? The number of people who develop hydrocephalus or who are currently living with it is difficult to establish since the condition occurs in children and adults. And depending on what's going on with you depends on when you get it. Some estimates report that one to two of every 1,000 babies are born with hydrocephalus. So one to two of every 1,000 babies, meaning mostly people with spina bifida, people with cerebral palsy, they are the varying amount of people getting the hydrocephalus. So, what causes
causes hydrocephalus. The causes of hydrocephalus are still not well understood. Hydrocephalus may result from inherited genetic abnormalities, such as the de genetic defect that causes aqueductal stenosis or developmental disorders, such as those associated with neural tube defects, including spina bifida, for example. An infant's ability to compensate for increased cerebral spinal fluid pressure and enlargement of the ventricles differs from adults. The infant's skull can expand to accommodate the buildup of cerebral spinal fluid because the sutures have not yet closed. The bones in their head, because babies are born without certain bones in their head, so their heads can get bigger if they have hydrocephalus. So. In infancy, the most obvious indication of hydrocephalus is often a rapid increase in head circumference or an unusually large head size. Other symptoms may include vomiting, sleepiness, irritability, downward deviation of the eyes, also called the sun setting, so your eyes are like constantly just looking down, and seizures. Yay, seizures. I've never had a seizure as, long, as far as I know. I've never had one in my whole life. And I really hope to keep it that way. So, so far, so good. Other older children and adults may experience different symptoms because their skulls cannot expand to accommodate the buildup of cerebral spinal fluid. Symptoms may include headache followed by vomiting. So, usually I get shunt headaches. I get a lot of migraines. It runs in my family. But... I never really get any other symptoms, so I usually just have to deal with it. It's very worrisome when I get these severe headaches because I do have a shunt, but I've had it tested, I've had it scanned, I've had it checked out numerous times throughout the years, even several times in one year, and still it's working just fine. I'm just lucky with having the extreme excruciating migraines all of the time. You also can get blurred or double vision, sun setting of the eyes again, problems with balance, I have that anyways, but that's not caused by the hydrocephalus. Poor coordination, gait disturbance, again I have that problem, but it's not caused by the hydrocephalus. Urinary incontinence, Again, I have that, but it's not caused by the hydrocephalus. Slowing or loss of developmental progress, lethargy, drowsiness, irritability, or other changes in personality or cognition, including memory loss. Symptoms of normal pressure hydrocephalus include problems with walking, impaired bladder control leading to urine frequency and or incontinence, and progressive mental impairment and dementia. An individual with this type of hydrocephalus may have a general slowing of movements or may complain that his or her feet feel stuck because some of these symptoms may also be experienced in other disorders such as Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease. That's a new one. I've never heard of that. Normal pressure hydrocephalus is often incorrectly diagnosed and never properly treated. Doctors may use a variety of tests including brain scans such as computed tomography and magnetic resonance imaging, MRIs, a spinal tap or lumbar catheter, I don't like those, intracranial pressure monitoring and neuropsychological tests to help them accurately diagnose normal pressure hydrocephalus and rule out any other conditions. The symptoms described in this section are account for the most typical ways in which progressive hydrocephalus is noticeable. But it's important to remember that symptoms vary significantly from person to person, just like anything. How is hydrocephalus diagnosed? It is diagnosed through clinical neurological evaluation and by using cranial imaging techniques such as ultrasonography, CT, MRI, or pressure monitoring techniques. A physician selects the appropriate diagnostic tool based on an individual's age, clinical presentation, and the presence of known or suspected abnormalities of the brain or spinal cord. Hydrocephalus is most often treated by surgically inserting a shunt system. This system diverts the flow of cerebrospinal fluid from the CNS 
But another area of the body where it can be absorbed is part of the normal circulatory process. A shunt is a flexible but sturdy plastic tube. A shunt system consists of the shunt, a catheter, and a valve. One end of the catheter is placed within a ventricle inside the brain or in the cerebrospinal fluid outside of the spinal cord. The other end of the catheter is commonly placed within the abdominal cavity, but may also be placed at other sites in the body such as a chamber of the heart or areas around the lung where the cerebrospinal fluid can drain and be absorbed. A valve located along the catheter maintains one-way flow and regulates the rate of cerebrospinal fluid flow. A limited number of individuals can be treated with an alternative procedure called third ventriculostomy. In this procedure, a neurondoscope, a small camera that uses fiber optic technology to visualize small and difficult to reach surgical areas, allows a doctor to view the ventricle surface. Once the scope is guided into position, a small tool makes a tiny hole in the floor of the third ventricle, which allows the cerebrospinal fluid to bypass the obstruction and flow toward the site of resorption around the surface of the brain. Right now, you are looking at different examples of different kinds of shunts. The only difference between a regular shunt and a programmable shunt is the little metal piece inside of it that you use with the magnet to program the shunt. There are also diagrams of where the shunt starts and where it ends up in the abdomen. What are the possible complications of a shunt system? Shunt systems are imperfect devices, just like everything in the whole world. Complications may include mechanical failure, infections, obstructions, and the need to lengthen it or replace the catheter, because sometimes people grow, and sometimes you need a longer one to reach proper areas. I have had one shunt replaced because I grew. I've also had one shunt replaced because I malfunctioned. When I was about six months old, my shunt that I had placed when I was a baby malfunctioned, so I had to get a new one. And then it was working just fine until I was about 13, and then I had to get a new one because I got bigger. But since I was about 13, 14, I'm 29 now, I've had the same one. So far, so good. <laughs> Generally, shunt systems require monitoring and regular medical follow-up. When complications occur, subsequent surgery to replace the failed part or the entire shunt system may be needed. And then, you get to have brain surgery. That is a big deal. That is amazing. But oddly enough, it was the most easy surgery to recover from because it's just, for the most part, it's just in your head. So all you have to do is walk out of there and deal with a little head pain for a while. It's a lot different than having to deal with a spinal surgery or foot surgery or something that moves a lot. But for me, shunt surgery was the easiest to recover from. Some complications can lead to other problems such as overdraining or underdraining. I've I actually had that issue with the shunt that I had replaced when I was a teenager, it was overdraining. Overdraining occurs when the shunt allows cerebrospinal fluid to drain from the ventricles more quickly than it is produced. So then you have not enough cerebrospinal fluid, and that's bad too. Overdraining can cause the ventricles to collapse, tearing blood vessels and causing a headache, hemorrhage, and slit-like ventricles. Underdraining occurs when cerebrospinal fluid is not removed quickly enough and the symptoms of hydrocephalus recur. Overdrainage and underdrainage of cerebrospinal fluid are addressed by adjusting the drainage pressure of the shunt valve. If the shunt has an adjustable pressure valve, these changes can be made by placing a special magnet on the scalp over the valve. I don't have one of those, so if they have to adjust my shunt, they gotta go in there and dig around in my head and fix it that way. 
In addition to the common symptoms of hydrocephalus, infections from a shunt may also produce symptoms such as low-grade fever, soreness of the neck or shoulder muscles, and redness or tenderness along the shunt tract. When there is reason to suspect that a shunt system is not functioning properly, for example, if the symptoms of hydrocephalus return, medical attention should be sought immediately. So, like I said, I get a lot of shunt malfunction-like symptoms, but every time I go to the doctor, they tell me that there's nothing wrong. So I don't know if I need a new doctor or if there's really nothing wrong and I'm just over dramatic and just worried all the time because I have a shunt. But obviously I'm still here. I'm still okay. So it must not be too big of a deal. I just have a lot of pain. But like I said, I have migraines running in the family so that might just be it. And my migraines like to play around in the shuntal area and that just makes me lucky too. What is the prognosis for individuals with hydrocephalus? Affected individuals and their families should be aware that hydrocephalus poses risks to both cognitive and physical development. However, many children diagnosed with the disorder benefit from rehabilitation therapies and educational professionals. Rehabilitation Specialists and educational experts is critical to a positive outcome. Left untreated, progressive hydrocephalus may be fatal. So, if you don't take care of yourself, if you don't treat it, you might die. And that's one of the biggest worries and concerns in the spina bifida community is people dying from hydrocephalus and other related issues. So that is hydrocephalus in a nutshell. I honestly thought this was going to be one of the shorter videos because hydrocephalus is just kind of one thing that we have to deal with. But it looks like there's a lot more to hydrocephalus than you really think about because you just live with it and you don't look at all of the details into it on a regular basis so yeah that is hydrocephalus in a nutshell and if you have any more questions related to this please leave me comments send me emails and I will gladly answer those either in the comments in a reply or in another video if it needs to be so until next time Bye.